to it means that you live in a city, and the city is growing. It's getting new homes, <laughs> new businesses, new technology. And with that comes a need for more electricity, because we all like to wake up and have our cell phones powered up in the And we like electricity, or air conditioning, and things like that. But in a city that's growing, your old power structure may not be able to handle those needs. So your city planners and your city utilities get together and they decide that they're going to site a new power plant. You may hear about this because you see something on the news, or a friend tells you, or maybe you get a flyer for a public meeting. So you decide to look up some information. You get on the internet, you look around, and, and you might find some things. So you might go to the website of the project owner, and here's what you would find. Hello, I am so excited to present to you this new, innovative, amazing technology that we are going to bring to your community. It is safe, it is reliable, we have partnered with the best scientists and engineers across the country to peer review this and ensure that your community will be safe. Unlike dirty fossil fuels, this is carbon-free energy. Unlike solar and wind, it's reliable all the time, not just when the sun shines or when the wind blows, and it takes up a whole lot less space. We are thrilled to bring you this new nuclear power plant. <laughs> okay, peer reviewed science. Okay, so let's look up some of the science. So you get on the internet, go to some of those websites, and you see, okay, it's a 300 megawatt equivalent, double loop, below design grade, with a seismic hazard structure to a 1 times 10 to the negative 7 probability of hazard exceedance, and it's got a reduction in the radionuclide inventory because of the type of fuel that it uses. Okay, sure, that could have that right. So you decide to go to the public meeting, and you hear the regulator, and they get up and they say, hello. Welcome to this public meeting. We, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, are going to make a decision about this power plant based on a safety review pursuant to Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 52, and according to Section 103 of the Atomic Energy Act. Also, we will be doing an environmental review pursuant to Reg 1748 under the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. Cool. <laughs> so at this public meeting, then someone gets up and makes a statement. And it's someone from the community. I am so upset because they are telling you that this thing is safe, they're telling you that it's reliable, they're telling you less radionuclides, but what does that mean? It means radioactivity. Did you know? They're telling you it's safe, carbon-free, but they're not telling you that it produces toxic waste that is incredibly radioactive. They could kill you. If you're near this stuff, it will kill you. Did you know that? There's not even a place to put it. It's going to be sitting there on site for tens of thousands of years. And when they do move it, it's going to be moved past our schools, it's going to be on our roads, past our children's playground. Okay. So now you're at the point where you're hearing a lot of this. Maybe you've identified more with one group than the other. But nonetheless, you have found yourself at this very complicated intersection of science, society, government, and industry. I'm going to take a deep breath. There is no nuclear power plant being sighted in San Antonio right now. I checked my email at the lunch. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Take a moment. Some of you are breathing a sigh of relief. Some of you may be disappointed. It's important. Hold on to that for a second. But nonetheless, maybe we don't have one coming to San Antonio right now. But we do make other decisions all the time. Right? I mean, we have to decide things like, in our own lives, whether or not to eat genetically modified produce, or whether or not to vaccinate our kids. And in the bigger picture, there are big projects that happen, like how we do power our cities and whether or not to lay very large natural gas pipelines that may have been in the news lately. These are things that come up. We're going to come across these intersections. How do we navigate them? So there's three things to try to keep in mind. The first thing is to try to separate fact and feeling. So a minute ago I told you there's no nuclear power plant coming. That's a fact. How you reacted to that is your feeling. And everybody in here is going to feel a little bit different about that because of your own internal biases, your own experiences that you have already had. So it's important to remember that just because a fact makes you feel a certain way, everyone else may not feel the same way, but that you have to separate them. Let me give you another example. We had an excellent talk earlier about automated cars. How many of you in here are afraid to fly? Show me. Nervous flyers. This is a safe space. It's okay. Nice <laughs> 
Did you know that from 2009 to now, there has not been a single death attributed to a U.S. commercial airline accident? Not one. And yet, in 2016, in Texas alone, there were over 3,700 deaths on Texas roads. You're all totally fine with flying now, right? My nervous flyers? No. It takes a minute. We have to process facts in order to make our feelings and kind of come in line with those. And the great thing about facts, the great thing about objective science, is that science is true whether you believe it or not. But it's how we react to that. So that's important. Keep in mind, facts and feelings. Second thing, understand that at any given time, you're not hearing every facet of the truth. So I gave you four different sets of information about this new hypothetical nuclear power plant. Everything I said is true. How can that be? Well, it's because each party is going to give you the information that they want to hear or that is theirs to give. So your advocacy group, I'm sorry, your power plant provider, the person who's going to build that, they want you to see the very best. So they're going to tell you the great things about carbon free. Check. The regulator is going to tell you the information that they can give you, which is here's how we're going to evaluate it. Okay, that's helpful, but it's a stay in your lane kind of information. It's not really addressing all these peripheral issues. The scientist is going to give you the data. They're going to tell you things about it that don't take into consideration those facts and feelings. And then the concerned citizen is going to give you a piece of the truth also that probably the power plant owner doesn't necessarily want you to hear, but it is still true. But what they're not telling you is that despite the fact that it produces this radioactive waste, there are ways of handling that too. And it's also incredibly well protected. So every piece of that helps form the puzzle. Every piece of that helps put together the picture. So there's a lot of different facets to the truth. So separate facts and feelings. Lots of different facets to the truth. And the third thing, the people sometimes fly. <laughs> it's really difficult. If you don't know how to feel about things and you're getting all this misinformation, when people use Truths, not just not just outright lies, but sometimes people use truths in a way that's unfair or misrepresentative of reality. So I can tell you that there is enough water in the air to drown you. Okay, is that true? Well, technically, yes. If I were to gather every water molecule in the room and put it in a bucket, see your head. Out. That is not going to happen, right? <laughs> We have to consider not just whether something is actually true, but how it's presented. And is it plausible? Is it probable? Are these things that could actually happen? So when someone gives you information and they present it in a way that's unfair or representative of some other version of truth or some other reality that they want you to see, a lot of times that comes because they use emotional arguments, right? So getting back to the facts and the feelings, we all want to believe what already aligns with our current state of mind. It's easy. It's just what. Thanks to the internet, we can all become experts in everything. Thank you, Google. But unfortunately, we're so stuck on self-justification, and we're so stuck on being right and not having to step outside of our own beliefs, that a lot of times we'd rather believe somebody who we don't even know, something maybe without credentials, that believes the same thing we do, rather than perhaps having a conversation with somebody who does have credentials, but maybe believe really something different. Maybe it's someone we know. We all have that person in our life who we lovingly disagree with, right? But regardless, there is sometimes just misinformation out there. How do we deal with that? By arming yourself with all that truth that you got earlier and learning to separate those facts and feelings. Now, none of this, none of this even matters if you're not willing to keep an open mind, if you're not willing to consider other points of view, if you're not willing to recognize when maybe you need to consider something else. There are some who say that we're in an era of post-truth. Maybe that's because of all this conflicting information. Maybe it's because we have so much thrown at us all the time that's presented in such a convincing way that it seems like, how can all this possibly be true? But really, we do have a lot of facts. We have a lot of things to consider. And next time you're faced with a decision you're trying to make in your own life, or maybe you're trying to help your community make a decision about something, these are the things that you can keep in mind. You can separate facts from feelings. Arm yourself with 
with every facet of the truth you possibly can and use that to separate out the misinformation. And then you too can manage these complicated intersections. Thank you.